Welcome back to A Fresh Story. This episode is part of a special series for October, as it is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. We are honored to hold space for these profound conversations and share these stories. These stories may be of grief, but they are also of hope, resilience, and most of all, unconditional love. As a reminder, be gentle with your heart. And if you are not able to listen to this episode at the moment, we understand and we're holding you close. These conversations will change you as they have changed us. I'll let these amazing women tell you in their own words. As we know by now, miscarriages may be very common, but they are not easy or simple by any means. In fact, they're complicated medically and physically, emotionally, mentally, politically. I wanted to talk to women who had experienced miscarriage, so I put a call out on social media and I got hundreds of messages. Messages from women who had never even spoken about their miscarriage until the second they sent me that DM. I talked to four women for this episode, and all of their stories illustrate just how complicated that term, miscarriage, is. There's so much involved that we don't talk about. I'll let these women explain in their own words. I talked to Kelly, who responded when I put the call out on social media for people's experiences with miscarriage. Kelly was very vocal about her own miscarriage experience, and she talks a lot about how we can support others through miscarriage as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I I actually want to share a little bit about how I got my first pregnancy. So everything went perfect. It seemed normal. And then all of a sudden at the end, I got postpartum preeclampsia a few weeks after my daughter was born. Almost didn't make it through that. So the fact that we went to try again was already a lot of emotions coming up, especially for my husband, thinking that, you know, he might not have a wife to take care of these children. And so and and a mom, right? One of the important parts of the equation. So when I did experience my miscarriage, it was after that first pregnancy. I was 12 or 13 weeks in, was waiting for that first big appointment. Um, You know, a lot of the doctors said it was something that you can go back to work. It's fine. It's going to be like a heavy period. It was not. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to come across to anybody who's listening is, you know, each experience is so different. And, you know, being a little bit further along, and and I know there are women who have even later miscarriages, which is so sad. It wasn't an easy physical experience. And I think that really caught me off guard. You know, physically, I was in bed for three, four days, could barely get up, had to, you know, go through that feeling of bearing down like it it felt like I was going into labor again. And nobody had prepared me. They said, take some Tylenol and get back to it, which is crazy. I was. And actually, I was transitioning companies. So luckily, I knew a lot of my coworkers, but they didn't know me at work very well yet. Um, So that, you know, was a really uncomfortable thing to have to kind of show up and say, hey, you know, I'm going through this. I'm going to need some time. I don't know what that looks like. Um, You know, everybody was great and very warm. And I think one of the most interesting things I tweeted about my experience, actually, and one of the interesting things that happened was so many women that I worked with or that I knew or that maybe I just followed on Twitter reached out and said, hey, I had the same experience and I never told anybody. And it's like, why do we not talk about this? It's so common. And I know that's another topic we're going to talk about here in a second. But just to jump to it, um, you know, with my next baby, um, the the little boy that is now a year old and is healthy and happy and perfect with his pregnancy. I actually got pregnant and three of my best friends and family members also got pregnant all within a week and a half. Unfortunately, he was the only one that made it. And I think the thought that I had already gone through a miscarriage, I had shared so publicly, all of our friends and family knew, you know, really opened a door for them to have that conversation with me when they unfortunately went through it. And I think, again, the more we talk about it, the more we admit how often it is, how common it is, the better we can all do for each other, right? I have a very strong opinion about this. Unfortunately, I think that the older generations were these incredible strong women that were taught and told over and over to suffer in silence. 
you know, and they carried the weight of the homemaking and working and all of these things. And, and they were told not to share those, those hard parts. And I think the generation that we're in, and hopefully even, you know, the next generations won't have that same belief that we have to suffer in silence, that this is something that you have to do on your own. And because men don't physically experience it and understand it, we can't talk about it. Right. And I think, the more and more we talk about it, the more we share. Unfortunately, when it does happen, you know, I was talking to a mom um, of a girl that goes to school with my daughter just two weekends ago, right? Friday pickup. She shared, oh, I'm barely pregnant. I just found out. And I said, if anything bad happens, of course, I am not wishing that on you. But I've had all of these kind of horrible experiences. Please feel free to reach out if that happens. Again, hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, and unfortunately, three days later, I get the message that she was having a miscarriage. And it's like, if I hadn't shared in that moment, who knows if she would have known somebody that she could open up to, right? And I don't know what her other friends and family are like. And I'm glad that at the very least, she knew that there was somebody else who had gone through this and somebody else that she could talk to about it. Because again, it is, it feels like such a private thing and there's so much grief and it is such a real loss, but really only for the mom for the most part, right? Like the dad is still, you know, not physically having that shared experience, not having met this child. So a lot of it does fall on mom and then mom ends up just suffering in silence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the second you start trying to get pregnant, you start envisioning what it's going to look like. And then you get that little bit of reassurance that it's happening and it's real and it's here. And there's a lot of time and a lot of things that can go wrong, right? And so I think, like you said, what happens is women feel, oh, it wasn't real enough yet, especially when it's an early miscarriage, right? And it is real. And it's real to you. It's real in your body. You're physically changing. You're emotionally changing to, you know, taking all the excitement and then the stress. And you have to give yourself time and space in whatever way is meaningful for you to actually go through those feelings, right? Because if you don't, it's going to creep up in weird ways. And another point that I, I really, as I was thinking about this podcast, I want to make sure I share this. One thing that was really helpful for me to recognize was how much of that trauma and that grief I was bringing into my last pregnancy. And the fact that when I got pregnant with our son, who is here with us now, you know, I recognized immediately I was bringing all the trauma for my first delivery, as well as all of the trauma of potentially losing this child. And so if anybody is listening to this and can hear it, if you have a friend who had experienced a loss at any point in a pregnancy, remember that when they do get pregnant next time, there's going to be that gray cloud hanging over them. And they're going to have that feeling, no matter who they are, that what if it, what if we don't get there? What if we don't get to the finish line? And Again, so while you can help and support the woman, you know, when she's physically going through it, think about all the times it's going to come up later, right? So every pregnancy she has after, every delivery she has after, there's always going to be that doubt. It's really hard to support somebody when maybe they don't even realize that it's coming back up, right? But, but it will, whether they want to admit it or not, I imagine. And and we can all rally around them and give them a little bit of extra love and support and you know, no matter what happens, hopefully we get a healthy, happy baby and a healthy, happy mom. But if not, you know, you've got a lot of other women who have gone through this. And if we all talk a little bit more about it, we have that tribe we need. I've known Amanda for years through work. And when I put the call out for people's stories, she responded immediately. I'm so glad she did. Her story is complicated and messy and so important to talk about. Hi, I am Amanda Lauren. I am an interior design expert. I write for Forbes, Real Simple, and a bunch of other websites. Um, I'm also a content creator. And I, um, I had a miscarriage in around March of 2021. So in December 2020, we found out we were pregnant and it was on the first try. And I completely shocked um and we were very very excited um and then somewhere in the middle of the first trimester I developed Bell's palsy which is basically when the the entire left side of my face and like even my arms were weak, like was basically non-functional so when I spoke it sounded like I had a brain injury 
Um, and as a result, um, you know, and I'd like, as I tell my story, I'd like people to keep in mind, people treated me as if I was less intelligent, as if there was something, you know, developmentally wrong with me. And I experienced um, real ableism. And it, this is something I don't talk about a lot. And I think that is part of the reason why so many, why it was so challenging. It was also during the pandemic. I came down with Bell's palsy. Um, and then I went to, I had a different doctor for my, um, for basically the 12 week scan, who then I had to go to a perinatologist because my doctor actually didn't have someone that did um, scans in his office, like hadn't had an ultrasound yet. Um, and again, I live in Los Angeles, so the whole thing was very odd, but it was during a pandemic. And during that time, you know, all the doctors were backed up. You kind of took what you could get because I was very uncomfortable speaking, even with a mask on, like, when I spoke normally, it sounded like I had a brain. Now, I could talk like this and really try to, like, enunciate every word and sound like a weirdo. Um, but because I was really uncomfortable speaking to strangers at the time, my husband begged to be let into the room. This room that I did the scan in, by the way, was, uh, you know, we were wearing masks. We offered to test. We offered to, you know, to quarantine. All of that stuff. We begged because I had this illness. And when I tell you this room was larger than the size of my first studio apartment <laughs> in downtown New York, um, me when I say that, we could have social distanced. Instead, after literally crying to have my husband in, I'll tell you what happened. So I'm alone and he... Old, he does the scan and he says to me, let me cut to the chase. Literally, like, my order from Amazon was going to be arriving late. Uh, you had a miscarriage. And I'm hysterical. And I am alone. And it, this guy, it was, as if it was an inconvenience to him. Um, I never found out why I had the miscarriage. because, And we did every single test. Um, what he should have done was actually measured the neck because according to my gyno, my regular gyno, not the perinatologist, it looked a little thick. So after, you know, finding out alone, we then drive to my other, you know, the two of us are hysterical driving to my, you know, the other gyno's office from the perinatologist and we get there and we're like, what do we do next? He's like, nothing. What? Can I have a pill? No, do you do a DNC? No, we're just gonna like wait to see what happens naturally. And essentially, I was forced to carry this baby by the, for about another month or two. I could have gone septic and died. Um, and my doctor did not want to do anything. And the mental part of it, the physical part of it, the bleeding, you know, I thought the baby had come out, it hadn't. Um, I had to, I mean, there were so many obstacles to involving the pandemic. Like we had to go to get um, a scan at this, like, I thought I had passed the baby. It turned out I didn't. We had to drive like an hour because I wasn't going to go in alone to get a scan because I was so traumatized from my first experience. We did not know what to do. And we were told, I consulted multiple medical professionals because I'm like, I'm afraid of going septic. I mentally can no longer handle this. And I was told to go to a hospital and lie. This was the best they could come up with, by the way. I know I just say this very matter of fact because I, at this point, because I pulled the story many, many times. Lie. Say you had a fever. You, you've had this dead baby in you for so long. We think that, like, your blood work's not going to be fine, and they'll, they'll give you a DNC. No big deal. No problem. So we go. We plan for it. I said, oh, I had a fever last night. I'm really not feeling well. I've made up all these symptoms. And by the way, this is a hospital in Burbank, California. Again, major, major city. So we actually never saw an MD in the emergency room. We only saw a physician's assistant. And I said, can we please do a DNC? I'm terrified I'm going to go septic. I'm really upset, right? I, I don't, I'm at my limit. I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. Um, and he said, listen, the laborist on, on 
duty right now. Um, I spoke to him and he doesn't think your insurance company is going to cover a DNC. So he doesn't want to do it. I'm like, what? Well, did he speak to the insurance company? No. Can he speak to the insurance company? Yeah, he's not going to do that. Can I speak to this person? Yeah, they don't want to speak to you. Um, I ultimately took, had to take the pill, which is, listen, I know some people prefer to pass a baby at home. I would have not preferred to have passed a baby at home. The happy ending is I have a gorgeous five-month-old girl who is the best baby in the whole world. I am madly in love with her. This whole situation, I will tell you, made the first trimester and a half of my pregnancy really stressful, really scary, not just because I was at risk for another miscarriage, because I'm like, well, what if this happens again and I'm treated like this again? Um, it was just really, really tra traumatic. And I felt so alone at the time. And I definitely, and it's weird because now, now that I've had a miscarriage and I talk about it, I can't tell you how many people I know who have had miscarriages. I would say a few months afterwards, I did realize so many people on YouTube have talked about this. And I'm like, why don't I think of so on YouTube? I think people are embarrassed or I think people think it's their fault or they did something wrong. And I think it's so painful to talk about too. I think like people don't want to, it's not that I don't think women want to support other women. It's that I think it is so pain. There is, there's nothing quite like losing a child, you know? I mean, I'm very lucky. I haven't experienced, I've had definitely had a, had a fair amount of adversity in my life, you know? Things have not always been, been easy for me, despite like the content that I create. But there is nothing that tops just like losing a child. There isn't. And I was like, I was so excited for for this baby we were so thrilled we had gone through a really challenging time in our marriage and this pregnancy really like connected us in such an amazing beautiful way i i definitely feel like the entire thing brought us closer but it's just so hard because you think it's also like you go through the internet helps and it doesn't help because sometimes you're sitting there and you're, you've maybe had like a semi-decent day. You've only thought about, you know, losing your child 25 times as opposed to 100 times. And then you get the little notification from people. So-and-so is pregnant. So-and-so gives birth to multiples. Like, Hilaria Baldwin has her 18th child. And I'm just like, I hate you. I hate you, Baldwin. Um, but it, it's the truth. It's like, why me? Like, why did this happen to, to me? Like, why? And I, I honestly don't know why it happened to me. And I, there's nothing positive about it. But I will say the one thing I really learned is I really wanted my daughter after this. And I appreciate her so much more than I think I would have had I just, like, gotten pregnant. Like, I love her so much more because I really wanted her. Alexa and I know each other from a Facebook mom group that we've both been in for years. We talked about the language around miscarriage and how hurtful it can be when somebody says something we don't expect. So I had a pretty arduous path to fertility um, and parenting and motherhood. My first miscarriage was in the spring of, I think, 2015. So it was an embryo transfer that um, was not viable. I was able to actually like pass that kind of on my own. Um, and and again, I think like part of my mindset around that loss was that's the risk of fertility treatment. Like I kind of felt prepared. I didn't tell a lot of people I was doing the embryo transfer. I. Um, bunch of people knew we wanted another kid but it was like okay well we'll just we'll just kind of go through this uh, it's to be expected right there was sadness but it wasn't um it wasn't shocking my 
The second miscarriage was more traumatic. It was very sensitive to semen. Like my my husband and I used condoms, but I got pregnant. And I don't, I mean, it was during the pandemic. It was like May of 2020. We didn't know what we wanted to do. We didn't know if we could afford a third kid. We kind of went back and forth. It was really emotionally wrought. We were like deep in shelter in place, um, trying to like function as professionals and parents of two young kids. And it was just like, it was a nightmare. I went in for a prenatal visit and um, there was no heartbeat. The nurse practitioner, I remember, said, I know you were struggling to make some decisions around this pregnancy, and it looks like your body's made them for you. And it, just the way, like, I, it was so gutting. It just felt like, it just felt like this, like, betrayal. And, like, the betrayal of your own body is something I'm very familiar with, like through infertility, through various like experiences in my life. And that just uh, really hit hit hard. Um, and then because it was the pandemic, I didn't want to do a DNC. I wanted to do the at home uh, pill. Um, and she was like, you've been pregnant before you've given birth before, like this should be pretty manageable for you. And it wasn't. It was awful. Um, I was shaking. I was so sick. I didn't want the kids to know. Like, it was just, it was brutal. And then I went back in the next week alone because it was like peak pandemic times. And so I couldn't have anybody with me as a support person. And they did a scan and they were like, well, you've cleared the gestational sac, but like you, there's still some tissue there. and We want to make sure we kind of clear you all out. So let's do another round of the meds. And I was like, okay, but at least I was like a little more prepared. Did another round of the meds. Felt like garbage, but it was like not as bad um, as the week prior. And then went in the next week. So this is now like week three in a row. Like one to find out there was no heartbeat. One to do the meds and the scan and a second scan. And they were like, yeah, you know, it's still there's still just like some tissue there. So we're going to we're going to recommend a DNC, which I had to do alone. It was really sad. It's still sad. <laughs> yeah, all my appointments were Fridays um, because Fridays like virtually were like in the virtual world was like a little bit more low key. But yeah, uh, all of it was Fridays. The The meds were overnight Friday to Saturday. Which was good because I think if it had been during the week, it would have been really, really brutal. Um, but no, I didn't take any time off. Like I uh, just kept on going. Uh, I'm a teacher. Yeah. Um, I was teaching summer school um, and finishing out probably one of the harder years of my career going remote. Yeah. And I didn't want the kids to know. So it was just sort of like mommy might be sick. I will say as as kind of brutal and sad as the DNC was like I did feel physically better afterwards like more so than I had for like the three weeks prior there was just like this feeling of like um fullness and like heaviness that uh I physically carried until the DNC and then I was like okay now I I am actually like clear of all of this I started seeing my current therapist like three months afterwards and um I went to therapy mostly because I was feeling profound rage and um and I said you know my thought was the rage the rage is really like loss and anger kind of manifested right and and that's the thing that we've been working on but I I yeah it's it was um it was something where like when I see kids who are the age like I needed a lot of support from friends when the due date came. I knew I knew that that was going to be really hard. So that was January 27 of 2021. I knew I knew that that would be hard and I still think about it like when I see babies that would be that age, I definitely still think about it a lot. It's it's complicated too cuz like my husband's a scientist, right? And he has a background in science and he, and he's sort of like it sells, right? Like 
it's a group of cells like you know let's not get too sentimental about it but then he was the one like as i was taking the medicine the first round he was like i'm sorry baby you know like it does feel like a failure honestly i was so surprised i was pregnant in the first place i thought i was having like stress induced early menopause or something like it was such a stressful time where I was like, the first thing my doctor is going to ask me is to take a pregnancy test. And even though that is like a biological impossibility and like absurd, like it is the thing that they're going to ask me. So I have to I have to take a pregnancy test. And I was shocked I was pregnant. I think because we're a culture that doesn't do well with like deep relational work around loss and we get really uncomfortable talking about loss and that includes life and death stuff that includes like changes of life that includes miscarriages and pregnancies um you know i think very few of us were acculturated with how to have these conversations around loss and i think there's a lot of shame and a lot of sort of like oh god what do you, you know what does that mean or that there's going to be some sort of judgment um and yet, anytime I've talked to, to anyone about it, like most women have had this experience. My friend Jane Kramer is a musician and she's experienced two miscarriages. We talked about how she used music to heal during these experiences. You can hear her songs Valley of the Bones and Child on her 2019 album Valley of the Bones. I have had two pregnancy losses, both relatively early, um, around 10, 11 weeks. Devastating nonetheless. They were both, you know, a few years apart. Just had a very, very profound impact on me. You know, I think I mentioned to you in another conversation that, you know, I'm a sensitive person, I'm an artist, and I'm someone that struggles with depression anyway. And, you know, a lot goes on in your body to begin growing a pregnancy and then um, to lose a pregnancy um, physically and emotionally and spiritually. You know, I think that a loss at any point in a pregnancy is devastating. You know, sometimes too, in an early pregnancy, maybe you haven't told a lot of people yet. That can add a factor of isolation that uh, that can feel just really, really hard to navigate. And so that was something that I that I struggled with, um, even though I do have, you know, a close community. Um, my own mother, you know, talked really openly, which I appreciated growing up, that she had three miscarriages in between having my sister and myself, each one being incredibly painful for her. And it even took me a while to tell her, which is interesting because it's just it's such a such a tender thing to speak about. And I guess sometimes speaking it makes it true. Yeah. So many of us from the moment we find out we're pregnant, if it's something that we want, and sometimes it's, I have to name that sometimes it's not something that we want, or it's not something that's going to be safe for us in our relationship or for the child we might be bringing into the world. And I have just as much compassion and um, uh, for that as well. And I think that that is just a very important freedom that um, people always need to be able to have. And I, I hope we can preserve that in this country very much. For me, I, I knew I had always wanted to be a mom. And because of certain life circumstances, I was coming to it a little older, which in conventional Western medicine, they tell you, oh, it gets really, you know, dot, 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 fill in the blank once you turn 35. And for me, I was um, 36 and then 40. Um, and didn't uh, end up having my, you know, wonderful, healthy baby until I was 41, almost 42. So just putting that out there, I deeply wanted to be a mother. And so, of course, I imagined the combining of my husband and myself and that this baby would have great rhythm, which even though I'm a musician, I don't. <laughs> so I sing about, I in that song, Child, I sing about, you know, um, just sort of, yeah, grieving all of the... Um, all of the things that I had imagined she might be, you know, a good dancer or, you know, dancing, dancing in the gra- bare feet, dancing in the grass and, and that kind of thing. And so, like you say, it's just, it's more than just a loss of, you know, um, cells and, you know, this, this very amazing, miraculous physical thing, but it's also um, the loss of a, of another life that you um 
you know, thought you were going to get to to live alongside someone. For me, writing, songwriting is, that's my therapy. That's my medicine. That's my way of, of feeling, you know, less alone um, in this skin. And so um, I, I turned to that song, Child, to, um, to express that. And I also just remember being like, this is so painful and it feels so lonely. Even though I have a supportive partner and supportive friends, it still feels lonely. And I, I don't think it's, you know, necessarily marketable or fun to put a song about <laughs> miscarriage, you know, or babies who didn't make it out into the world. Um, but that makes it even more important. Because if there's one other person um, who has experienced this, who feels like, um, you know, I'm, I'm touching and um, encouraging them to, you know, to feel their grief and to feel safe and feeling all that, to feel less alone, then, then that's, you know, then that's a, a silver lining from this really difficult experience. A Fresh Story is produced by Fresh Starts Registry. A heartfelt thank you to all of the women who shared their stories in this special series. And a special thank you to Alex Mooney, who has been our special consultant for these episodes. If you are experiencing pregnancy or infant loss, we hope that these episodes helped you feel a little bit less alone. We love you, and we are holding you close.